Hello, good evening. It is your girl Bridget and Sumenta and we are live on AYT TV empowering you. Welcome to AYT TV yet another episode of Barara University of Science and Technology still commemorating the 16 days of activism raising awareness about GBV and looking for solutions and how to end the inequalities. Today is the 1st of December 2022 and annually we always we always commemorate on the lives uh, of the people our beloved ones who died with HIV and also raise awareness about HIV pandemic is it HIV infection that leads to the AIDS pandemic hopefully I'm right that way <laughs> so today it is another day just in town, everyone was just putting on these ribbons, the red ribbons. So I was, uh, I was seeing how people have, uh, have come up to raise awareness, to show that HIV still exists, that AIDS exists. And in that, the message they are carrying is that we should be keen not to, uh, not to be victims of HIV because it still exists. And yes, as we always say, that it has no cure. So to be on the safer side, you have to protect yourself from HIV AIDS. Uh, with me on the show, I have a very important and incredible guest, and she is Mrs. Gladys Nakalema. Lovega. Lovega. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome to AET TV. Uh, thank you so much, Bridget. Uh, being newly married, you have to chip some things in there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm. You can say hello to the viewers as we start. Hello viewers, it's good to be here once again in, at this time of the year we commemorate the World AIDS Day so I'm happy to note that in this year we're focusing on young people and uh, I will to get into the details later but young people are very important in this day, uh, in this age so I'm excited to share with Bridget one-on-one um, uh, -on -one and see how we think about and how we really contemplate on HIV AIDS in 2022 versus 1980 something. Why do you think that uh, in this generation, like in this century, people still have insecurities on talking about HIV? Especially the young adults and since we are targeting them mm. in the, uh, according to the theme of this year. Well, that's an interesting question. And the reasons for feeling uh, uncomfortable discussing HIV-related matters now are quite different from those that were in the past. In the past, it was more of a, you would be looked at as you were either immoral or you had unprotected sex and things like that. Or sometimes even it was looked at as witchcraft. Uh, but today the situation is different. Um, it's because uh, the face of HIV has changed over the years. Before it was, you could be slim, literally the word slim, you look edged, you look like you're going to die tomorrow. Today, everybody's healthy, everybody looks good. So uh, discussing HIV would be the same way you'd, you'd discuss uh, an elephant in the room that was not there before. We will talk about, say, mental health. When people do not know you have a mental ailment, they are okay with you, they interact well. But if they hear that you have any, you're battling a mental illness, all of a sudden they're handling you in a delicate manner. So this is similar to HIV AIDS. There are individuals who have lived with HIV all their lives, who are born with HIV. So they've learned to take care of themselves better. Uh, some have lived with HIV for over 30 years. So they have taken, they have taken care of themselves. So they do not, they, they, they're shying away to discuss HIV related matters. It's simply because they want to lead as normal, lead normal lives as possible. That's one, I think. The second thing is uh, they wouldn't want that to get in the way of how they interact with others, you know? Because at that point, if I tell you that I'm HIV positive, chances are you're going to, every time I sneeze, you're going to be on edge. That's one yeah. if you care about me. But every time I have, uh, say, an interaction with someone and you suspect there's a relationship, you will feel like I'm being unfair to this other person. So you may feel like probably I should, you should disclose my status and things like that. So it's, 
really one of those things that the reasons for that is so that people live a normal uh, or try to live as normal lives as possible. For me, that's what I think. And truly so, it has to, got to be a trusted relationship for somebody to be able to tell you, yes, I'm HIV positive and this is what I do to make sure that I'm healthy and so you're going to support me through this if possible and things like that. So they have to have a trusting relationship to discuss that. Okay. And that's for the positives. For the negatives, it's a whole different affair. Okay. So for the people to be able to be open and share their relationship or the way they stand in regards to HIV, yeah. maybe I think that sometimes others do not have that confidence because of some insecurities mm -hmm. or because there are very many inequalities that they do not want to face. And if so, what could be some of the inequalities that the people living with HIV are likely to face? Well, uh, it goes back to what I mentioned that mm. there will be the inequalities will only manifest if I mention that I'm HIV positive. positive. Mm. If I did not mention it, you are going to give me that uh, opportunity to play in the same teams as other my fellow peers. You're going to give me the opportunity to um, say take the mic and sit here with you and that and without you focusing on whether i'm hiv aids positive or negative mm. so the inequalities only manifest when the person declares so and some of those inequalities are, are things to do with say uh, being able to interact with peers um, the peers will always either hold you be on edge trying to make sure that you're fine uh, even when you when it's not that you know, alarming in, in, in situations where you may be in danger. Or um, they may try to say things like you should not date that person, you know. Now that the theme this year is focusing on young people, some of the challenges young people will face is having healthy relationships with their peers. Yet we all know there's, there are certain levels of uh, protection if someone has been uh, taking their medication over the years and they're adherent, their viral load will be extremely low. And if they engage their social, uh, their counselor or their health uh, worker, they should be able to come up with ways of having healthy relationships, you know, with their partners. But all that may not even come to light in case someone says, I'm HIV positive because the other people will be saying, why are you with this person? They're HIV positive. So most of the inequalities are only when someone declares or dis dis discloses that they are HIV positive. Okay. Yeah. So for instance, if at all I've already disclosed that maybe I am HIV positive, yeah. uh, I know that will the next step will be discrimination. Yeah. So according to what has been said and what we've also noticed for ages, for years, we've seen that discrimination of these marginalized people always affects the, the HIV response or the, it, it disturbs, if I can say it like that, mm -hmm. that people may be taking the statistics, stuff like that. What is your thought about that? And uh, like uh, identifying what kind of statistics for this uh, Maybe how question. many people are, in Barara, mm -hmm. yeah, take an example of Barara. How many people in Barara are affected by mm -hmm. this disease? Mm -hmm. So, what I was saying, discrimination of these people, mm. of the people with HIV, mm. how does it affect the HIV response? Well, uh, how you treat or the response or the attitude towards uh, individuals living with HIV uh, is going to get in the way of uh, uh, those who may not know their status. Uh, accessing services to test because it's once they, are, they they get the revelation of whether they're positive they will be afraid of how they'll be treated because they've seen that before so they will not bother when I was a student and it's still the same thing with students these days um, testing for HIV is like waiting for <laughs> waiting for the biggest news in your life you know you will be anxious, you will sweat because you're thinking, if I am positive, what is going to happen to me, you know? So there is that uh, worry and fear, so they will not access services easily, services to, to test for HIV, but also once someone even hears that I slept with someone who may be HIV positive, then they would 
they would even think that they're already positive. So they will not uh, try to access those services and further on adhere to medication because they feel like, now nah, I'm a gone case. Until, because they're dealing with all this in their minds. You know, they are not really seeking the help they would need to live better lives. So it really broadens the gap. The discrimination broadens the gap in accessing services and also discussing HIV as something that we need to learn from, uh, learning from those who have lived longer, how do they handle, how do they manage, and how do we ensure that uh, we support them. Okay. Know, like that. So breaking it down to must, hmm. to borrow University of Science and Technology, you talked about the services, the access to the services. Are there any interventions uh, as the university that you've put in place to mm -hmm. always help out the people that are living with HIV? Yes, there are. We, as a university, we have handled this both administratively, but also practically. Mm -hmm. So administratively, we have an HIV AIDS policy and we have other complementing policies uh, such as the one on sexual harassment, we have others on gender. Those are complementing policies because they really um, boost a healthy living and comfortable environments where an environment is considerate and uh, adaptable and supports individuals to live positively. Uh, and that is positively regarding HIV, but also the usual issues that matter or that affect every growing person. So administratively, we are put in place policies to ensure that uh, when someone comes into the university as a student, they transition uh, into a, being a responsible adult. And how do we do that? Now, we've translated our policies into practice where we have several um, student groups uh, that organize uh, routine activities. Okay. So first we have the peer educators that we train. We train them in, um, we have a peer education package that runs over about, about two weeks and they are trained in life skills, uh, that is skills living, of living with oneself, skills of living with others, and then skills of effective decision making. And then we also go through the current trends on HIV, um, how do you educate your fellow peers? How do you facilitate sessions like this or even better sessions, which are group or focus group discussions? So these peers are trained and given this package so that they reach out to fellow students. So the, stu the peer educators further on organize different uh, activities that are geared towards discussing current students' challenges and challenges out of the classroom, really. As we all know, when you reach the university, you're excited about being independent. And uh, right now, if you smile at someone and someone smiles at you, it's not like, oh my God, you're going to get in trouble with a teacher. It is, okay, we like each other. So how do those particular uh, relationships and feelings get regulated? So in the peer education uh, activities, some of these things are discussed. How do you identify a healthy relationship? How do you avoid uh, risky situations, risk, uh, avoiding finding yourself in risk, uh, engaging in risk, risk sexual behavior? You know, um, how do you ensure that you don't find yourself in someone's room at 8 p.m. and you're not able to get back to your hostel? You know, and if you're getting back to your hostel, how do you do that without putting yourself in danger, uh, say, getting raped? Uh, those other issues where you use drugs and then you find yourself at a party and you don't remember what happened. So most of the activities organized by the peer educators really target what's affecting students right now. And these activities are supported by the university. Um, the other student organizations like the Ministry of Health and the Guild also organizes a health awareness week that each and every year focuses on HIV and sexual reproductive health. That's good. You know, and then we usually incorporate other days such as the Women's Day and other gender ministry where we handle sexual reproductive health still or gender-based violence. In a way, HIV AIDS is not only being infected through sexual relationships, but what happens before that? You know, that's most important to consider. So that's why we, co we take on 
different, we, we approach it from different angles. When we talk about gender issues, we talk about HIV and how someone becomes, or that protects themselves. If we talk about uh, the Women's Day, same thing. Health Awareness Week, same thing. So we tackle it from different angles. So the university has really uh, supported these particular uh, activities and for us to address HIV and sexual reproductive health. Okay. What about, uh, you said you, you cater for the sexual reproductive health and HIV awareness. I want us to talk about, to take an example when maybe a, a person has been raped mm -hmm. and they do not know the status of, of the perpetrator. If at all they reported to you, and maybe they do not know about the policy. Mm -hmm. And in any case, do the students know about the policy? Do you also create awareness that people can know what is in the policy? Yes. Um, I, we do every year when we receive students, uh, mm -hmm. we talk about uh, all the different policies that we have. But most importantly, we talk about what the expectations will be when you're at the, at the university where you're going to stay. We talk about hostels and how to get your hostel. And then the drug parties, we know there are drug parties. We know all these things. So in the first week of the first year, a lot of information is given to the students. Mm. Many times we don't expect them to remember this information. But if you do recall this information and reach out, so they may not be aware of the policy simply because they did not pay attention. Mm. But the one thing that I'll, I'll I'm confident about is they always remember that in when you're in trouble, you run to the dean of students office. Okay. That's the one thing students remember. And so when they approach us, or when we hear, sometimes we just get messages of a student was hacked, a student was raped, and all we need are the details of the student, where they stay, and we get to them. So what happens if someone gets raped? Uh, when, when someone gets raped, regardless of whether they know who has raped them or they do not, there are certain procedures that are followed both by law and by health, uh, the health sector. So we normally concentrate on the health sector as a department. So we'll link this person to care. They will get uh, help from a counselor. They will get some medication to prevent HIV and pregnancies. And, and we will also keep with them until we see that, okay, they uh, have settled now and they are ready to, you know, continue with their classes. So they continue with the counselor over time beyond the health care so that they're able to settle and be able to really concentrate on their books. So it's really an unfortunate incident, but usually we encourage uh, individuals or, or students who have information of this nature reach out to us within 48 hours. The earlier, the better. Okay. Thank you so much, Mrs. Nakalema Lubega. Thank you. Gladys. Thank you, Bridget, <laughs> for having me. Yeah, I, I do not need to ask her the, the safety precautions that people have to take, especially the students within this environment, because she mentioned it all. Mm -hmm. And she was brief, but straight to the point. Thank you so much for watching. We remain a Yeti TV empowering you. We meet every evening at 5 and at 6 p.m.